Good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us at C1. We just want to welcome you guys, and it is awesome to see you. And um, we just, if you are a guest visiting with us this morning, if you're new, or maybe you need to update your information, um, please, uh, please grab a Connect card. We would love to connect with you and just let you know a little bit about what we are as a church and, and um, what we have going on. And so just make sure to fill out that Connect card, and you can hand it to one of the staff members after service, or you can put it back in our offering boxes, which are directly out there, little green boxes going out the door off to, off to the uh, right side. And we would just love to connect with you. And, uh, we also want to let you know that here at C1 Church, we are intentional about who we are as a church. And we want to make sure that the church is very intentional about, intentional about connecting people with Jesus. And so here at our church, uh, our mission statement is to put people into a growing relationship with Jesus, to n- connect them, to make a difference in our community, and to, to just love on people. And so that is what we are about here at C1. Yeah, I mean, I know that's like the best thing about it. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ is like nothing else. It's absolutely amazing. And I, you know what, guys? It's got me through a lot of really hard times. So continue with that like we're going to continue like giving with our faithfulness too um as you've seen we have boxes up by each door um uh, to do for our giving instead of us passing plates right now and everything uh we got text to give at 84321 and then we have online giving at c1.church also again i want to say thank you so much for everyone for following our guidelines and allowing us to meet in person because these guidelines have really helped us and as we continue to follow them during this season of covid it's a uh, it keeps us in the stage where we can meet in person. Because I don't really want to go back to meeting online all the time. Although, I love meeting everybody online that's meet, that is currently online. I want to do both. I don't want to do just a single thing. So, I like seeing your faces in person. And I like seeing the people that we interact with online. So, let's just do both. And again, thank you so much for following our guidelines. Y'all have been outstanding. Yes, and thank you guys for just your faithfulness to the church and your faithfulness and your giving. It is making a difference. God is is doing some amazing things, and we are very excited for the season that God is going to uh, launch us into, and we are so so thankful that you are along for the ride with us. Um, We're going to pray real quick, and then we're going to enter into worship. God, we thank you that you are so faithful. We thank you that you are here, and we thank you that, that... God, there is nothing that is impossible for you, that we serve the God, the King of Kings, the God that that moves mountains for, for our small situation. God, you will move mountains to get to us. And Lord, we pray right now that you would open up our hearts, our minds, that you would speak to us today, that when we leave, that we would leave on fire for you, that we would leave and our our neighbors, our family would be able to tell that they have been, that we have been with God and in your presence. Lord, we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our home, our strong Wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the L
upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong worshiping him and uh, the spirit of truth because he is the everlasting God um, and we need him we always need him but just with the times how they are right now um, it's just so evident and uh, right in front of us how much we really do need God and need to rely on him and not our own strength and not our own knowledge not our wisdom but his I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you Every hour I need you You're my one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you This it runs deep Praise the Lord. If I can get this to work. <laughs> that need is so great. <laughs> Sounds like someone got a hold of them. I think that's awesome because a lot of people um, we rely on feelings for our faith and uh, you know the ambiance of a room and that feeling we get into worship but worshiping God is every moment not just through singing or, or perfect but in all the messiness and all the silliness uh, worshiping God in all of our actions um, so that's just a good reminder that always worship Him 
my sin runs deep Your grace is more Your grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay let's sing that again she's my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you And Jesus, you're my hope and stay My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. The splendor of a king. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god hey, used to age he stands Time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God and three in one, oh, and Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb.
so much for your greatness and Lord I just pray as we look at you and see that greatness and that love that you have for us and the wisdom that you have for us I pray that we wouldn't let that be in vain not something to be looked at and just awe but to lead to action to lead to action from the calling you've given us to be your disciples to be fishers of men to go out into the world and share your gospel And Lord, it's a light that shines so bright that we shouldn't hide and keep away from people. So Lord, please give us boldness. Take away our fear. Take away our pride. And let us lean into you and trust you as the kingdom continues to spread. Love you. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a good morning. It's always a good day when we can gather together as a, as a corporate body and to worship the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. It's going to be not just a good morning. We're going to have a great time today. I'm excited. If you guys are new here, I, my name is Ryan. Uh, my wife and I were the lead pastors here at C1 Church, and it is truly an honor and a privilege to pastor such a wonderful people. Uh, such a wonderful church. And guys, this morning I'm excited for a couple of reasons. I'm excited because we're worshiping Jesus together. I'm excited because we have air conditioning in August in Tennessee. You know, like that, you can't get excited about that, then your wood's wet. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm also excited, probably the most excited, because we are launching into a new series called How To. And it's a series over the book of James. And um, the reason why I'm excited about this, I I probably say this every time I preach, uh, but James is arguably my favorite book in the entire Bible. Like, Mark is my favorite gospel. If, if If I had to choose, I would choose Mark. I love them all, though. But James is probably my favorite book. Like, the only one that I think could TKO James, in my opinion, is Romans. But... I, I love the book of James because if, if you did not have time to read any other book in the entire Bible and you had to pick one book to read and you're already a Christian and you needed advice on how to live this life as a believer, I would tell you, go read the book of James. It is an excellent how-to book. And James, 
What's so amazing about this, if you read the Gospels, you, you see James, but he's not called by name because there's two disciples named James, but we're talking about one of Jesus' little brothers that authored the book of James. He's a pastor of the church in Jerusalem at the time. He's writing to all the scattered people of Israel. He's giving them advice of how to live a, a life by faith not by law anymore. He's, he's trying to pastor the, the Israelites in this transition because you got to understand, at the time when he's writing this, Christianity is literally a new belief system. And they're trying to pastor people to, to shift their mindset from following the law to walking by faith in God and in Jesus Christ. And so he's writing this book. And in if you read the accounts of Jesus interacting with his family, his family throughout the Gospels, man, Jesus would be teaching and, and his, his brothers would be like, Jesus, you're embarrassing us. You need to get out of here. You know, like they, they would say stuff like that to Jesus. And they're like, Jesus, your family's here to escort you out. And Jesus is like, this is my family. He's talking to his followers and stuff. And, and like they were ashamed of Jesus because he was such a radical person. Like, his teachings literally got him killed. And because they were so counter to how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the time believed the law should be followed, and yet Jesus is following the law perfectly, how God wanted it to be followed, and, and Jesus is, is flipping their culture on its head, and, and then his brothers were giving him advice once he started doing miracles. He's like, Jesus, if you really want your ministry to grow, you need to go down to Jerusalem and do this stuff. And, and Jesus is like, you, your time is right for you all the time. I will go when I want to go. And Jesus um, always got this advice. And, and suddenly, like, it was almost like his little brothers didn't believe that he was truly the Christ or truly the Messiah, truly God and man. Because guess what? They grew up with him. Jesus was a guy to James that probably stuck him in a headlock and gave him a noogie. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, like he was like, if I were a big brother, that's what I would do. Um, but Jesus obviously was perfect. But suddenly there's a shift, though, because once Christ rose from the dead, it was settled in all these doubters' minds. He is God. There's no, there was no doubt left. And then suddenly, these people that grew up with Jesus as an older brother were worshiping Jesus as God. And we step into this book called James. And James is actually the first martyr for his belief in Christ. They took him to the top of the temple and they threw him off. And that didn't kill him. Then they took and stoned him, which is just throwing big rocks until he died. He wouldn't renounce his faith in his older brother because he knew Jesus was God. And he gives us such a practical book about how to walk out this life. And today, I think we are going to be hitting a section of Scripture that is so relevant to every one of our lives, especially in this season, because every one of us are facing trials of many kinds. Every one of us. On a, in a normal year, in a year that um, we, we don't have a pandemic, in a year that we don't have tension, in a year that we don't have this exponential amount of media coverage about different stuff, we all face trials. But this year seems to be the exception. People are out of work. People are depressed. People are anxious. People are facing things like they've never faced before. And some people are facing old things that they haven't faced for years. And so we're going to look in James chapter 1, and I, I don't know whether we're going to work all the way through 1 through 8. I, I'll tell you, 
Well, we're going to look at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. We're going to start in verse 1. He says, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. So, like, you, you see that the shift in James, Jesus' little brother, from him being brother to being God. There was a shift, and that shift happened after Christ rose from the dead. But then he gives, arguably, some of the best advice. You know, everyone has that one scripture that is their favorite scripture or set of scriptures in the entire Bible, right? Like, just, just give me, just, just throw, throw something out. Ra raise a hand and, and just, if, you, if you want to, and tell me your favorite scripture. Come on, someone. Anyone? Yeah. You could do all things through Christ. Anyone else have a favorite scripture? Psalms 23, great scripture. I quote that when I'm hiking, when I don't think I could make it another step. <laughs> like, oh, Jesus, you are my shepherd. <laughs> Any, anyone else? You learn to be content with what you have. I love it. Um, anybody else have a favorite scripture? 2 Timothy 1.7. God does not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. That's a powerful scripture. For me, my favorite scripture in all of the Bible is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And I learned it in the NIV, which we're going to read here in a moment. But here it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when, you, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So I'm going to stop right there for a moment. And can you go to the NIV it should be, this is how I learned it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And everyone else, especially athletes, they always had Philippians 4.13, like they would write it on their shoes so when they're running they could just, I can do all things through Christ. And, and, and for me, when I was probably 12 or 13, I was reading the Bible, and I got to the book of James. And this captured my heart. Like this, this consider it pure joy when you face trials. This doesn't make sense. But because you know that the testing of your faith develops something, so James is getting at something like there's a way to consider trials joy. And I think that that's the tension that every Christian lives in. Because we know, and this is not the first time Paul or the Bible says something like this. Paul echoes this in Philippians. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Like, there is throughout Scripture, there is this idea of rejoicing through trial. But James so just pointedly, straight up says, consider it joy, or consider it opportunity for pure joy. And I don't know about you, but I've like I'm only 30, 31, 31. I'm only 31 years old. I'm too young to forget my age. Um, but I'm pretty sure my wife is 34, so um, I, I don't know. I don't know her age either. I'll do the math later. Uh, but 
I do know just in my short amount of time of being live, I've faced trials. And there's this tension as we face trials to have joy. But how can we have joy in trial? Because it doesn't make sense to have joy in trial. I remember when I had my, my uh, I've had many car accidents, but the one that affected me the most was a car accident I had in 2012 where I rolled a uh, Toyota 4Runner and I went flying out through the sunroof. I cracked my skull, my eye socket, my jaw, and I broke my pinky. And uh, I, I, I got some scratches and everything. No, they could not fix my face. It is permanently like this. Uh, that's why I have a beard. No, I was very fortunate. But I just remember not not being not really feeling this overwhelming joy laying in the hospital with a C collar on and in constant pain on on morphine and oxycotton. And I thought, how do I have joy in this? And that's just one of the hardest seasons of my life. But that's that's affecting me physically. But then there's there's seasons of depression, there's seasons of uncertainty, there's seasons of anxiety, which all rob you of joy. Now, there's a difference between joy and happiness. And so often we we want happiness, but the Lord tells us to have joy. In fact, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So it doesn't say the happiness of God is our strength. That doesn't make sense because there's a, joy can include happiness, but it doesn't have to. But we like happiness. We like things that make us smile, like ice cream. We like things that tacos. Let, let, let's just keep going. Jambalaya, Cajun food. I mean, like we like stuff that makes us smile. Everyone's like, now my mouth is watering. Thanks a lot. Um, I know where I'm going to eat. Um, but happiness is different than joy. Joy is literally a character trait and a fruit of the Spirit. Happiness is based on your circumstance. You can be happy in a moment and sad in the next. If you don't believe me, I'm going to send my two-year-old home with you. He's happy in a moment and sad in the next. Happiness changes based on what's happening to you but joy is something that you decide I'm going to have joy I'm not going to let anything rob me of my joy I'm not going to let anything rob me of this because when when the enemy comes at your joy and he likes to come at your joy because he, he when you're robbed of joy it's easy to put depression in when you're robbed of joy it's easy to put anxiety in when you're robbed of joy it's easy to get you to focus on your circumstance and not on who your God is through your circumstance. And James tells us here, consider it an opportunity for pure joy. So how do we get this? And that is the question that we need to answer. And the only thought I'm going to give you today, one thought, how to consider it an opportunity. How to consider trial, and opportunity. I want to say, this is not a catch-all. I'm going to give you, I'm going to try my best to break down what's happening in James chapter 1 in these few short verses. And I think we can walk out of here with a better understanding of how to consider what you're going through. Because I guarantee you, if we all closed our eyes and we knew that no one else would know, and I asked the question, how many of you are going through trial? And if we let down that church facade, every one of us would have a hand go up. Every one of us. But we, we put on this brave face. We put on... Our church smiles, and we're like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Not to be heretical or disrespectful, but there is this old commercial during the Super Bowl, and I thought it's so true, this 
gentleman from the south, I think he was from Texas, walked into a New York bar. And the bartender goes, how you doing? And there was like eight people at the bar. And he asked the first person, he goes, how you doing? And the first person goes, how you doing? Like that's just, that was the exchange. It was like, how you doing? How you doing? And then he just goes down the line. He goes, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Like that was it. It was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just how you doing? Over and over and over. And he gets to this guy and he clearly has a cowboy hat on. And he, the bartender looks at him and he goes, how you doing? He goes, well, I'm doing fine. I just got me. He just goes into this whole life story of, of how he was doing. Like he, like, and I, I think sometimes we need to be more like that. We, we are so much like that. How you doing? How you doing? How you? Do, oh, I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm not going to open into a rap or anything like that. But we get in this mindset of I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. And then we don't let anyone in to really know how everything's going and like like the church is here to support each other and we need to like we grieve with those who grieve we we mourn with those who mourn we rejoice with those who rejoice we we're, we're supposed to be that but if we don't let people in and we don't let people help and we don't let then then that doesn't happen so sometimes we got to let down these facades and and there's this opportunity here that we that James says that that trials afford us pressure affords us Tribulation affords us that nothing else in your life can afford you these moments. Only trial can afford you this. And if you understand what trial can afford you, then you then you can have joy in certain in, in trial. But it's only when you understand what trial affords you that you can have joy through trial. And and and, and it starts with trust in God. Okay, if I'm going through this, God, I know that nothing happens without a reason. I, 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 I don't know the reason. How, how many of you guys have ever had that, that, that conversation? I don't know the reason, but I trust you, God, because your word says you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, I love you, and I know you've placed this calling on my life, so I'm just going to trust you, even though I don't know the reason for, for this. I don't know why I'm laying in a hospital bed, and I feel like I'm going to die, and I have to have brain surgery. I don't know, but I'm going to trust you. Even though I'm kind of mad at you <laughs> for allowing this to happen, but I know you're working it out. Am I, am I the only one that has these conversations right? You know, I, I can't be. But James says, consider it pure joy because there's something that trial and tribulation afford you that nothing else can afford you. And how do you consider it an opportunity? Well, there's a word. I, and the reason why I read both the New Living Translation and the NIV, there's two words used, endurance and perseverance. Those are two different words. And from, from just skimming it, you might think, well, perseverance and endurance, they mean the same thing. No, they don't. They don't mean the same thing. And the word that James used in the original, um, in the original language for, for perseverance and endurance was hupomone. And I had to put the pronunciation because I don't know how to read the first one. I just want to point that out. Hupomone is defined as steadfastness, consistency, or endurance. Well, perseverance isn't in there. It, it actually is. Steadfastness and perseverance are actually the same thing. Perseverance means steadfastness, and steadfastness means perseverance. So hupomone, he says... Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops hupomone. It's easier to say endurance. It's easier, but it means both. And this is why it's an opportunity because hupomone means perseverance and endurance. Now, perseverance is defined as 
continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. The action or condition of an instance of perseverance, steadfastness. I did not all caps that. That was in the definition like that. So, it's to keep at something in spite of difficulties, failure, or opposition. I think that is one of the most encouraging things the Bible can say. To persevere. It's a continued effort. And the reason why... Technically, if you talk to me or we've ever come close to having a conversation in this area or arena, I've probably brought up perseverance. And if you know me, you know that perseverance is probably my favorite word because it's continued effort despite difficulty, opposition, failure. That means God says to persevere. Within that word, persevere, God expects you to fail. What? What does that mean? It's okay to fail. It's okay to mess up. It's okay not to have it all together. It's continued effort. So I remember learning to ride my bike. I had training wheels on it, just like my daughter's bike right now. And one day my dad said, let's take your training wheels off. You don't need them. I got on my bike and fell over. But now I ride my bike all the time because I continued despite my failure. And that means you are going also within this word is opposition. As you walk out your faith, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. As you walk out your faith, there will be opposition to your faith. And that's okay. It's okay to have opposition. It's okay to fail. It's okay. It's okay to have difficulties in this. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. Jesus was for you. You're expected to go after Jesus. Just keep going after Jesus. You fall, you get up, you keep going after Jesus. You fall, you get up, you keep going after Jesus. Now, endurance is a little different. Endurance is defined as the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. So that means endurance is much more momentary and perseverance is much more seasonal. Let me put it into an imperfect example, but I'm a, I was an athlete for most of my life and I still dabble in exercise. And so this July... I kept telling myself this whole year, I need to do cardio. Said no one ever. It's awful. Let's just be honest. There's a reason why Proverbs 28.1 says, wicked run with no one chasing them. But but, but But the righteous are as bold as lions. There's a reason for that. Um, But I was like, okay, I gotta do cardio. Like I like to lift weights and everything, but What really triggered it, one day, I was playing tag with my daughter and my son. To put it in context, I'm 31. They are two and four, and they were running, and we made one lap around the house, and they kept running, and I stopped. And I went, (sighs) like one lap around the house, and I thought I was in good shape. I was like, Sky, you're it. I just changed the rules. Like, Like, I was like, okay. That might be a sign for me to start running. So I kept putting it off. I'm like, oh, I need to run. I need to run. I need to run. I had a friend in Missouri that he was like, yeah, I've been running and all this. I got my mile down to this. I'm like, sweet. You know, I'll go do it. I ran a mile and a half. And I thought, nope, I'm not going to do that again ever. Like some people can enjoy running. 
The reason why I don't enjoy running is because when I played basketball in college and throughout my whole life, running was how we got in trouble. We would mess up or whatever. We would have to run sprints. And so for me to say I enjoy running, every time I go to run, I think of all the times I had to run because I was in trouble in basketball. So I'm like, this is just not enjoyable. I'm like, <gasps> and, and then my knees hurt and all this stuff. I'm like, you know what? But I do enjoy biking. And it's like, I'm just going to start riding my bike. And I said that for three months. Amy's like, I thought you were going to start riding your bike. I'm like, I'll start tomorrow. Like the pro procrastinator's creed, tomorrow never, <laughs> tomorrow never comes. It's always today. So finally in July, I was like, enough is enough. I'm sick of my two-year-old outrunning me. If I don't get him within the first 30 feet, I'm just going to wave by. You know, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going... And I, I get on my bike. I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do seven laps around my neighborhood. And I thought, that can't be that bad. They say for every three miles you ride your bike, it's like one mile running. So you, you technically do have to do more distance on a bike to get the same amount of exercise you do as just running. But the difference is my knees don't hurt afterwards and stuff. So I did seven laps through my neighborhood. And it was like 6.5 miles. I got off my bike and I thought, oh, Jesus, you've raised the lame before. You can raise the lame again. Like, I could hardly walk. My legs were so jello. But I tell myself every day in my personal creed, I finish what I start. So I got about two laps in to these seven laps, and I'm like, I can't finish this. I'm like, no, you can finish. You finish what you start. And I had to endure the individual exercise that day. That's endurance. It's pushing through without giving way. Perseverance, on the other hand, was two days later when I came back to ride again. Perseverance is coming back again. Endurance is in the moment. Perseverance is in the season. And that's why James used the word hupomone, because to consider trial joy, you have to have endurance in the moment and steadfast perseverance in the season. And if you don't have both, you will quit and you will stop and miss a blessing that God wants to give you. And that blessing might just be the lesson you learn through the season. But you can have joy knowing that God's developing in you something. And, and, and guess what? I, pers I, I endured the exercise. And so many people, they stop at endurance. But guess what? It's not a single exercise that makes a difference in your health. It's a season of single exercises over and over and over again that adds up to that adds up to fitness. In basketball, we would start training for the season in August. The season didn't start till November. But we ran and ran and ran. So we would have the endurance for the game, but we had to persevere the training. And so I, I kept coming back for more every other day. I started with that, and I would... I would get back on my bike. My legs would still be sore. It would take like three laps just for my legs not to be sore from the previous exercise. And then, like, by the time I got done, they were all sore on a whole new different le level of soreness. And I'm like, God, I don't know if I could keep doing this. And I don't know, like, I, I don't know why I kept going, but I have this in the back of my head. I finish what I start. And I'm like, Ryan, I know that you are getting in better shape. And so how endurance and perseverance work together, you endure the moment. But perseverance is what gets you through the season. So the whole month of July, I did that. I started out at like six miles, and now I'm up to 11 miles. And... I'm like, I don't know, but I do know this. That's proof that I'm getting in better shape. 
I do know that I'm going faster than I did the first time. Like I've been averaging like 16 miles an hour. The first time I did, I was like 13 miles an hour, which is like, I don't know. I don't know whether that's good or bad. I don't know anything about biking, but I just know I've been keep pushing myself to persevere through this. I know that's an imperfect example, but, but the, the benefits of enduring the exercise and persevering the exercises lead to a benefit of being in better shape. Are you tracking with me? And the same thing is true for us when we go through trial. And that's like that doesn't even compare to some of the trial that we go through as individuals. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us has faced cancer. Some of us, like the, the, the benefits of enduring without giving way. I'm not going to let this rock my faith because my God is good no matter what. He's faithful no matter what. I'm not going to let this rock me. I'm not going to give way. I'm not going to give into despair. I'm not going to give into depression because my God is with me. God, my God is for me. No matter what my circumstances are saying right now, my God is for me. My reality might not live up to my expectation of what I thought my life would look like, but I do know this. My God's for me, so I will endure this moment. And guess what? I'm going to persevere this season. I'm going to keep coming back for more. It might just be showing up at work every day with that one coworker that you wouldn't even be mad if they got a flat tire on the way to work. You know that one? Like, God, maybe you could just let their engine blow up. I, I, I don't know. I mean, just keep them away just for a couple days. That coworker, that all they do is bring misery and despair. Like you'd think that would be their last and middle name. You can endure it. You could persevere through it. Maybe it's the constant bad news from healthcare professionals. And man, you would think that if you watch the news, that's all we're getting right now. But let me tell you, God's still in control, and we can still have pure joy in this season if we endure it and we persevere through it. It's momentary. It is momentary. Uh, just FYI, when I get off my bike now, just in a month, the other day I rode my bike in the morning. I did like 10.77 miles, I think. And I got off and I went and mowed my neighbor's yard. Then I turned around and mowed my yard. My legs weren't sore. It's just momentary. It's momentary. If you just take and endure. And, and he says, consider it pure joy. James understood what perseverance and endurance affords you. And that's how you can have pure joy when you take and look at trial because you said, okay, this perseverance and endurance is working on my faith. So what do we have faith in? That's the question. It's working on my faith because he's saying it's going to make you whole and complete, not lacking anything. But the question that we have to ask is what our faith is in. Because if you're enduring a, a, a season of trial and tribulation, no matter what it is, and you don't have faith in God, well, it's going to wash away, and you're still going to be rocked. It's, your, your, your perseverance is going to be for nothing, because whatever you put your faith in other than Jesus Christ, it's going to let you down. If you put your faith in people, they're going to let you down. If you put your faith in, in, in your job, it's going to let you down. If you put your faith in circumstance, it's going to let you down. But if you put your faith in Jesus, the testing of our faith, Man, I'm just going to believe in Jesus no matter what. I'm going to trust Jesus to get me through this. And you know what? If I live, I live. If I die, I gain. I'm just going to trust him. And no, don't let your, your faith give way. You keep at it. You won't be perfect at it, but you just keep putting your faith in Jesus time 
and time again. That's how you make it through these seasons of trial and tribulation. That's how you can have joy through this. And I, I can't help but think in all this can't help but think that there are probably people here, Rourke, if you would. There are people here that are going through something and they need to, to refocus their faith. Maybe they've put their faith in, in other things. Maybe there are people here that need to ask the Lord, help me in this time to have endurance and perseverance. This Hupomone. Lord, because I'm really having a hard time seeing the joy in my circumstance right now. It seems like everything's flying at me from every angle, and I can't even turn on the news without getting depressed. I can't even, I can't find an escape. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ is your escape from this trial, He's the source of your joy. And we can have pure joy in knowing that He's going to see us through. If we endure and we persevere, and I I truly believe that, I, I I just can't help but think there are people in this room, in this crowd, that just need a moment to talk with God, to say, God, I need you to refocus me on who you are, to realign my faith in you, because I've been trusting in other things and it, I just keep falling short and I'm not enduring well I just keep giving way but God you say that we can consider it joy to face trials and I'm not finding that joy but I know that God you want it so help me endure help me persevere and the cool thing is God wants to He wants to walk with you in trial. He wants to walk with you through hardship. He's not one to leave you in the midst of it and say, okay, you can endure it, go for it. No, he's right there with you. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, learn from me. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That that idea of coming to Jesus with our burden, with our trial, with our needs, and saying, God, I need your help to persevere in this season. I need your help to endure this moment. And Jesus says, that's right, that's good, that's good. I got this. Get up under here. And that yoke that he's talking about, in biblical times, they would pull a plow with a yoke of oxen. And what they would do is they would they would take and have an oxen on one side and an oxen on another, and then they would have this wooden yoke that that put their power together. So instead of one ox pulling the plow, when you yoke, you, you, you would often yoke a strong ox with a weak ox, and then they would pull together, but the plow didn't know the difference. It was just getting the ox power, I guess, or horsepower from the, from the yoked oxen. But what that did to the weaker ox was it would actually make the weaker ox keep up with the stronger ox and would build its strength, but yet it did, still didn't pull all the load. The bigger ox was pulling the load and all the other ox had to do was keep up. And when Jesus says, bring my yoke, put my yoke upon you and learn from me, he's saying, hey, get up under this thing with me. I'll carry the load. You just need to keep up with me. Follow me and learn from me. And I I can't help but say that's how we persevere. We get up under this yoke and we follow Jesus. That's how we endure. We get up under his yoke and we follow Jesus with our trials. We bring them to him. Our, 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 Our weaknesses, we bring them to him. Our anxiety, we bring them to him. Our depression, we bring them to him. Our sickness, we bring it to Him. You're not designed to carry this alone. He tells us to consider it joy. 
in it because it develops perseverance, but he wants to carry it with you. So what we're going to do today as a response, I'm going to pray. Rorick is going to lead us in a song. If you need prayer, I'm going to be up here. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, maybe the what you're carrying is a lack of a relationship with him. And maybe the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart and you don't even know what it feels like. Man, I, I just, I've never heard this about Jesus. I, I just want a relationship with him. And I don't even know what that looks like. You know what it looks like? Jesus said, if you believe that I'm the son of God, if you believe that I died on the cross and you, that I rose again, then you're a Christian. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that he is Lord. And if you've never said, Jesus, forgive me. Come be Lord of my life. I'm going to be up here. I want to pray with you. If you have a need, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to pray with you. But I, I truly believe that there are many people in here that just need to find that alone moment with God to say, God, here's my burden. Here's my need. I need help to endure. There are people going through trial right now in this room that no one knows about, but God does, and he's right there for you. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, let's stand. And as the Holy Spirit leads you, I would encourage you to respond. The, the altars are open. If you want to come and find a place to pray, there are empty seats to pray. You could turn around in your seat and pray. But the reality is what I don't want to happen is us to to ignore the Holy Spirit as he's saying, hey, I need to talk with you. You need to talk with me. That might just be as simple as kneeling at your seat, sitting down and just praying. It might be as simple as coming up and just pouring your heart out. I don't know, but I do know this, that God is for you and God is with you and he wants you to endure and persevere in these seasons and have joy doing it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are more than enough. I thank you, God, that you see us through every season for every reason. I thank you, God, for this year. I thank you for what it affords us. I thank you, Lord, for the joy that you're going to give your people today. I thank you, God, that you're going to restore joy as we say, God, I'm going to consider this season joy because I know that the testing of my faith develops perseverance. And perseverance, when it's finished its work, will make me whole and complete. I thank you that you want to make your people whole and complete, lacking nothing. I pray right now that you will check every heart right now. Lord, if there's people in here that are going through trial, that you will just encourage them, Lord, through your gentle through your gentle nudgings of the Holy Spirit, that, that, that encourage them to respond how you want them to respond in this moment. Lord, there are people here that need salvation. I rebuke fear in the name of Jesus and let them step out in faith to put their faith in you. Mighty God, I pray. And Father, I pray for every person that says, well, this is a great message, great reminder. Lord, I pray that we worship you like there's no tomorrow, because you're worthy of all of our praise. In your mighty name. Amen. As Rorick leads, let's respond.
cease my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay won't you teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand or fall on you Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay And Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you You're my one defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I Holiness is Christ in me. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my right. God, the everlasting God, you do not faint, you won't grow weary, you're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in up on wings like eagles our God you reign forever our hope our strong Hold your head up. Hold your head up. You are not defeated. Hold your head up because your God is for you. Hold your head up because your God is with you. Hold your head up because He conquered what you're facing. Hold your head up. You are not a victim. You're not a victim of circumstance. You're not a victim of generation. You're not a victim. You are more than a conqueror. So hold your head up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
God's good. He's so good. Let's just give him, let's just give him some praise. Let's just give him some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Man, we could stand here for eternity and clap, and it wouldn't be enough. We could stand here and say, thank you, Jesus, and it wouldn't be enough. He's so good. He's so faithful. I want to pray over you. I truly believe that testimonies are going to pour in this week. Maybe not because circumstances have changed, but because perspectives have. It's amazing what happens when we step back and get our sight off of what we're enduring and back on who our God is. I truly believe perspectives have changed this morning facing trials Father I just thank you so much I thank you for your grace I thank you for your mercy I thank you for sending your son to do what I can never do and no one on this planet could ever do and that is to be the propitiation for our sin the atoning sacrifice for our sin I thank you Father for making a way when there was no way and that you continue to make ways for your people when there is no way. You continue to turn seas into highways. You continue to open doors that no man can open. I thank you that you continue to close doors no man can shut to guard us and guide us. I thank you, Father God, for the joy that is going to overwhelm your people this week as we face trial. Lord, I thank you for the endurance, the the hupomone that's going to hit us, the perseverance that's going to hit us, that no doubt, even this week, that we might have circumstances that come at us, but we're going to have a different perspective, knowing that our God is greater, knowing that our God is stronger, knowing that our God is more than enough, that it's not the end. I thank you, Father, for what you did in your people's heart today. And Father, I pray that as we leave this place, this building, that we will walk out into this world as a force to be reckoned with for the kingdom of God. I pray that your spirit will dwell within us in such a powerful way that when we speak to people, they just experience the love of God. Help us to be the church. Not the church that we think we should be, but the church that you want us to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Man, I love you guys. Have a great week.